Hallelujah. Welcome, brethren, in the lovely name of Jesus. It's a privilege and an honor for me to share the Word of God with you today. And yes, we are separated, but yet we are one when it comes to the Word of God. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you, Father, for your Word. I thank you for your grace. And I thank you for your mercy, Father. We just knew every morning, great is thy faithfulness. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you've given me the opportunity to share your word with your people this day. I pray, Lord, that you'll speak through me, Father, nothing of me, but all of you, Father. I bless you, Lord, and I thank you for your grace, for the measure of grace is given according to the gift of God. And I thank you, Lord, for the gift that you've placed within us, Lord, and that you have made us all able minister to share your word, Lord, to teach and to edify your people. I pray, Lord, that your word will bless your people this day and that they'll find refuge in it and strength, Lord, to overcome. For your word says that we are more than overcomers to them who are in Christ and are the called according to his purpose. Not about us, Lord, all about you. And I bless you and I honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, brethren, I stand before you this day, not in my own strength, but in the strength of the one who sent me and who called me to share his unadulterated word this day. Yes, we find ourselves in a pandemic. Yes, we are back to level four, but don't lose hope. Find strength in the word of God. His word says that he's never failed us and he never will fail us. Fail us. He is our real reward. He will be with us unto the end of the age. Yes, the pandemic is trying to show us that we can do things on our own. But the amazing thing about the pandemic is, you know, there's mega churches where there's 20,000 people and in these churches where there's only 50 or 100 people. But the pandemic has made the playing fields all level. Money cannot sustain them at this time. It's their faith and their trust in the Word of God that's going to get us through this pandemic. One of the scriptures that I find so amazing is found in Isaiah 55 verse 1. And this is what the scripture says. It said, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Verse 2 says, Wherefore do we spend money for that which is not bread? And the world is saying, we cannot live without money. We need money. Yes, the word of God says that money answereth all things, but also the love of money is the root to all evil. And this is the amazing thing about the word of God. It says, come ye and buy without money. And in our understanding, this is impossible. How can we buy without money? No, you can once you have the word of God with inside of you, because the word of God is the thing that will sustain you through this time. It's the word of God that will help you to overcome the pandemic. It says, come buy without money. Then it says, and he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat, yea, come buy wine and milk, you see, through the word of God, which is sig sig signified by the waters, and through the waters and the word, it will lead you to wine. And wine speaks about revelation, and milk is about abundance. And this is the thing that we must understand, that when you come to God, through the word, you'll get revelation. And through the revelation of the word of God, you will go into abundance. There will be no lack. One of the scriptures that amazes me also is found in Luke 10 verse 3. It says there, Go your ways, behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. And 
You know, when you step out of the house of God, wherever you find yourself in the workplace, you have to counter wolves, people that's doing things contrary to what the Word of God is teaching. And it says here, carry neither purse, which refers to money, nor script. When it says script, it means that you have your own ideas and understanding of how to get by every day. But in Proverbs 3 verse 7 it says, Be not wise in thine own eyes. You see, when we come to God, we want to work out things and say, You know what, this is not right. This is the way things should be done. But no, that is not. You know, God has a, uh, the word of God says that his foolishness is wiser than the wisdom of man. It says, Be not wise in thine own eyes. And then it says, No shoes. You see, when we come to God, we want to plan for tomorrow. You know, what's going to be uh, our food for tomorrow? But God is saying, just come. I will take care of tomorrow and salute no man by the way. What God is saying is be single-minded. When you pursue His word, it's not about the one next to you. It's about you keeping your eyes on the prize. The word of God says, he who runs the race runs against all. But one receiveth the prize, so run so that he may obtain. So we're not going to look left nor right, but we're going to keep our eyes on the prize. Yes, God is looking for a perfect church. He's looking for a church where the doctrine is preached, where there's pure doctrine. You see, he's looking for a house where there's unity, where there's togetherness, where brethren stand in the gap for each other. This is what God is looking for in the church when he comes he wants to see one of my favorite scriptures is blessed are those servants whom the lord when he cometh shall find watching verily i say unto you he will gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them and this is what god will do when he finds unity when he finds the brethren looking out for each other and this is what god wants of us not to be an island no, one of the scriptures that I find amazing is found in Ecclesiastes 4 verse 9. This is what it says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to lift him up. And this is what we must understand in the house of God. It's not about the individual. It's about us working together so that when there's a need, we can supply our brother's need. The word of God in Matthew 18 verse 20 says, Where two are, or three are gathered together in my name. You see, this is a like-minded thing. Where we are gathered together, God will work. Yes, God will work. He wants us, as I said in Acts 2 verse 44, it says, And all that believed were together and had all things in common. You see, God wants us to be like-minded. 45 verse 45 says, And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Verse 46, And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat the meat with gladness and singleness of heart. As the verse said before, that he will gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. This is what God wants. He wants us to be like-minded. He wants us to be there for each other. Similarly, in the Macedonian church, when there was lack, they sold all their possessions and they saw to the needs of those who lacked in the house. And God did great miracles in that church. Hallelujah. Bless the name of Jesus. One of the things that I've been reading and studying uh, is found in Ephesians 2 verse 24. It says, In whom ye also are builded together for inhabitation of God through the Spirit. You see, builded together. You see, God makes His habitation and His abode where we work together. It's not about you. 
It's about building the house of God together. This is how we get the blessing of the Lord. The word of God says how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity for then is the blessing of the Lord. You see, for you to be blessed, we're looking at going out and laboring each and every day and sweating for us to be successful. All that God is asking of us to let pride be put aside, to humble ourselves, come into the house of God and let us work together in one accord and unity. This is what God wants for us to be effective believers. You know, many, many um, churches abuse their position, the pastors. You know, they, they, they twist the word for self-gain, but it's not supposed to be like that. It's not. You know, the, the, the shepherd needs to feed the sheep. He must have a, have a selfless life where it's not about him, but edifying his sheep. This is what Ephesians 4 speaks about. You know, it's about edifying the saints that we all can come into the unity of the faith. You know, I believe that if Christ is formed in us through the word, we can become even Christ. Even Jesus said, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus who thought it not robbery to be equal with God. You see, there it's again, the mind of Christ be equal with God. And this is what we must understand that we need to get to a point where we look out for our fellow brethren that there be equality in the house of God and the word of God will be even more effective. This is why it says that the four pillars of our faith is doctrine, breaking of bread, fellowship and prayer. Once we apply these things or principles in the church, the house of God will be more effective. The one thing that I've, I've, I've learned about us as believers is that we are so self-consumed that we forget about our brethren. One of the, the things that, that, that got my attention was you know, when, when Moses um, was called of God to deliver the Israelites from Egypt, Egypt obviously significant or symbolizes the way of the world. And it says there in Exodus 1 verse 8, Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. You see, as long as Joseph was in Egypt, Egypt was successful. Joseph signifies Jesus, which means that God gave him a dream and because of this dream and the vision, he could supply everyone's need during a time of famine. You see, this is the importance of the word of God. But even through famine, God will supply your need. Even through famine, we as believers based on our unity in the faith and our togetherness, we should walk in abundance. But we lack to understand that it's about us being together for the word of God to be effective. But Exodus 5 verse 2 says, And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? Yes, his first mistake. First, they did not know Joseph. Secondly, he did not know or understand the word of God. You see, the first thing that happened in the life of Moses when he came to Egypt to, to deliver the Israelites was that Aaron's rod, which signifies the word of God, was turned into a serpent and the serpent consumed the serpents of the magicians in Egypt. The word of God will consume anything that will want to come up against the people of God. Once the word of God is resident inside of you, you will overcome any and everything that wants to bring you down. And this is the thing that happened here in Israel, that is um, in Egypt, 
apologies. Egypt was not um, uh, defeated by the people, but it was defeated by the word of God. The first plague that came upon Egypt during the de deliverance of the Israelites was water turned into wine, into blood. And this signifies that, you know, the blood started to stink and this led to death. The first miracle that Jesus did was he turned water into wine, you know. And this signifies that, you know, water was used as to wash the feet in the vessels, but then turning it into wine, which means that they had to consume or drink the wine, which led to revelation. And this is the difference, you know, when the word becomes part of you, you when the word becomes your daily life, your daily food, it will lead to revelation. Yes, God is more interested in us in becoming one with him so that he can fulfill his purpose in our lives. What an amazing God. You know, he's, he's, he's all comes consuming. I was sharing with one of um, the brethren as I was sharing and reading the word of God. We have a father in heaven who wants his children to be exactly like him, to bear his image here in the earth so that he can present us faultless. This is what God wants without blemish or wrinkle or spot. Hallelujah. This is what God wants of us. You know, as I've been meditating on the word, God has shown me an amazing account in the Bible where doctrine is so important. You know, the word of God says that through wisdom is an house builded by understanding it is established. If we don't understand the word of God, there will be no growth. There will be no deliverance. We won't be able to overcome. And there won't be any prosperity. One of the scriptures in the Bible says that he that heareth the word and understandeth it not, the wicked one come and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. Our responsibility is to guard our hearts, to guard the word and fight and contend for the word of God so that the word of God can be established within us and that the word will remain within us so that we can bring forth fruit so that our Father can be pleased with us. This starts first and foremost in the house of God where there is unity, the Lord commands his blessing. And I want us to understand this day that without the word of God, we are nothing. Exodus 5 verse 9 says, let their more work be laid upon the men that the, they may labor therein and let them not regard vain words. You see, when there's uh, not an understanding of the word, we, our first thought is always oh, there's lack. We think we must work harder for us to be successful. But the word of God says in Matthew, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon thee and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know when you put the yoke upon the ox, if the, the yoke is unbalanced, the ox will move one way. If it's the one is heavier than the other, there's no steadfastness, there's no togetherness, there's no equality. And what happens? There's no harvest. You see, the ox and the yoke, yes, there has to be a balance because an, an, an unbalanced weight is an abomination. You see, God don't want us to have discord in the house. He wants unity in the house. He wants togetherness and he wants a balance. He wants all of us to prosper. He says in his word, I want you to prosper even as your soul prospereth. And the only way your soul prosper is through the word of God. There's nothing, no other way for any believer that wants to prosper in this life to have success and to overcome any challenge that is thrown at him. The only way they can do it is through the word of God. And this is where you find peace. Nothing, nothing will give you peace but 
the Word of God. And then we find ourselves in houses where, you know, one of my, my favorite scriptures, which is also in Isaiah, it says that in Isaiah 28 verse 20, let me just read that scripture for you. It says, For the bed is shorter than that a man can stretch himself on it, and the covering narrow, narrower than that he can wrap himself in it. Bed speaks about rest, covering, a place of safety. You see, we cannot take shortcuts. We must be established in the Word of God for us to find a place of rest and for us to be covered at all times. There is no covering without the Word. For a believer, he must have the Word of God. The Word of God must be established in you. There's no other way you can do it. I would urge you, brethren, even during this pandemic, you have time. God has given us time. You have time. Use this time to study the Word of God, to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightfully dividing the Word of Truth. When you seek His face, God will come and make and make his abode with you. God will come and sit with you. He will meet with you and he will serve you. Once he sees himself in you, this Father, this amazing God will come and have his habitation with you. Let us not neglect this. Let us not neglect the reading of the word. Let us not Brethren, during this time of us not being able to come together, neglect reading and studying the Word of God. You know, the, uh, the one thing that amazes me during this time is that even brethren now that doesn't really understand the Word of God actually finds themselves in a position where they're saying that, you know, um, Yes, I understand that we are the church, but they are neglecting or finding comfort in the fact that we don't have to gather. I was just reading one of the scriptures, and Jesus, when he was young, his parents was looking for him, and lo and behold, where did they find him? They found him in the temple. And that says it all, how important the coming together of the saints, the togetherness of the saints. David said, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. Yes, people. Yes, our refuge and our strength a very present help in trouble. Let us come together in one mind and in one accord and defeat, Lord, what the enemy wants to make us believe and think that we are on our own and that he will, according to his system in this world, supply our need. No, there will be no rest when we do things the world's way. Let us now just take this opportunity just to stand and glorify this God, this King who's come and has made us whole through His Word that we should have no lack. Father, we thank You, Lord, and we bless You. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And as I'm going over to do the communion with you. I'll pray that as we do this, that we will remember the death of our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Bless the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Bless the name of Jesus. Father, hallelujah. We thank you and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Hallelujah. Welcome to our communion table this morning, brethren. I deem it an honor and a privilege to be able to break bread with you this day. Yes, I know, you know, we are not gathered together, but yet, you know, we are able to have communion in our homes so that we can be strengthened and remember the Lord's death. Hallelujah. As I was sharing about the togetherness in the house of God, I want to take you to an account 
in 1 Samuel chapter 25 about Nabal and Abigail. Let me read the word of God to you. Hallelujah. Verse 2 in chapter 25 says, And there was a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel. And the man was very great. And he had 3,000 sheep and a thousand goats. And he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal. And the name of his wife, Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding. And of a beautiful countenance. But the man was churlish and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of Caleb. Here we find the house where wisdom and understanding dwelt, and the husband was churlish, which means he was rude and he was evil. And the reason for him being like this is because he put in his trust in his possessions. You see, sometimes we think our money and our possessions make us, and in actual fact, we are foolish. The Word of God says his foolishness is wiser than the wisdom of man. We should put our trust in the Lord our God. The word of God says that some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord, for the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run in and they are safe. Chariots speaks of wealth. Horses, our strength and our power we have. We should not lean on the arm of flesh, but we must put our trust in the Almighty. Even during this time, we should put our trust in Him. Then, Verse 10 in this account reads as follows. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David and who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his own master. David's servants, when they were in the field, took care of Nabal's sheep. David then sent his servants to Nabal for him to reward them. And because of Nabal's pride and putting his trust in his possessions and his wealth, he said, who is David? What must I do with, who is he? Not understanding the position that David held in the kingdom of God. David then was disturbed by what Nabal told his servants. But look at what Abigail, Nabal's wife, did when she heard the response and the reply of Nabal to David's servants because she knew David. She knew the word of God. She had wisdom and she had a good understanding. Verse 18 says, Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine and five sheep ready sheared and five measures of parched corn and an hundred clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and laid them on asses. And she said unto her servants, Go on before me. Behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband, Nabal. And this she did because her husband would prevent her from going to David because he did not acknowledge David. And the amazing thing about what Abigail did was through wisdom, she applied the four pillars of our faith. Doctrine, breaking of bread, fellowship and prayer. It says that she took 200 loaves, she took two bottles of wine, 
and five sheep ready to be sheared and a hundred clusters of raisins fellowship. The bread. This is so amazing that two people in the same house but totally different understanding of who God is and what is expected of us. She humbled herself, whereas Nabal was filled with pride. And the end of Nabal's life was death. And as we all know, Abigail married David. And this is so important for us during this time of crisis, that we as a family, as a household, can still practice the breaking of bread and have fellowship with the Almighty so that we can be strengthened from within and overcome this pandemic, this thing that wants to separate us one from another. This is the thing that will keep us together. Yes, the enemy thinks that he's keeping us apart because he knows and understands that with his unity and togetherness, the Lord commands his blessing through the breaking of bread and the blood of Jesus, we still can have unity, togetherness, fulfillment and victory through this. So as 1 Corinthians 11 verse 24 says, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take Eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 25, after the same manner, also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, this is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as as he drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as he eat this bread and drink this cup, he do show the Lord's death till he come. Hallelujah, brethren. Be strengthened by this word. Stay in the faith. God is with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. In Jesus' name, amen.